Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the last lecture before the long weekend. Um, I hope you get to have some fun on the weekend, whatever it is you're up to. I'll try to keep today's lecture on the Narvison piece relatively short and sweet. I know there's been a lot of content this week. It's, it's been a busy week. Uh, next week is a little bit of a slower week. It's only a, a three-day week in terms of new content, so a couple of articles, uh, one new movie. And then the week after that's a little busy again, and then it's, um, I believe after that, I think it's our, our last week. Um, at that point, I think it's even just the, the part week after that. So we are hurtling through this course at uh, quite the rate. So this Narvison piece that we've got here. Um, so we were looking at Singer's piece last time on whether or not we've got a duty to aid uh, you know, people people in, in dire need. Um, so we can think about it as this question, you know, do we have a, a duty to aid the distant needy, uh, right? People who are suffering and dying due to lack of resources. And of course, we see this in Elysium, but we also see this in our own world right now. Not We don't have to go 100, 150 years into the future to um, see this as a, a live issue. This is something that occurs right now. So do we have such a, a duty? You know, do the citizens of Elysium have such a duty? Narvison's answer, we don't owe them a thing. So Narvison himself, uh, like Singer, a contemporary philosopher, um, he is a uh, distinguished professor emeritus at the University of Waterloo in Ontario. Um, so that's, uh, he, he's been around for quite a while. Now he's known for his works on Contract Aryan Ethics, which is really what we're going to see here. Uh, libertarian political theory, uh, which is really an approach to political philosophy that wants to maximize individual freedom as much as possible. Uh, he's also very active with chamber music, the chamber music scene in the Waterloo area. So he's been uh, president and organizer of the Chamber Music Society there for a number of years. Um, he's a very extensive record collection, apparently, uh, and, and the very interested in music in addition to his philosophical activities. All right, so what are we going to see here? Uh, and so the, the full title of Narvison's piece is, we don't owe them a thing, tough-minded but soft-hearted, uh, oh, and I'm going ahead and covering it up again, view of aid to the faraway needy. So gives you, I think, a pretty good sense of, um, a pretty good characterization of what Narvison is going to tell us in this piece, which we can uh, break down into a few um, parts again. So first, he's going to talk about uh, what duties are, what moral duties are on the contract views. We're going to get really a nice little explanation of the contractarian approach to ethics. And this is part of the reason why I picked this piece, because it's, it's very much on topic. It's, you know, it's very much on point. Uh, it's of a good length. And he covers quite a bit of ground uh, and explains things in a way that makes good sense to somebody not already familiar with the, the kind of moral theory that he wants to champion. Uh, in fact, he has been championing for a number of you know, decades, I guess, at this point. So he tells us what duties are and really explains the contract view and then clarifies what aiding the distant needy entails. You know, what, what does this actually require of us? And then ultimately argues that we don't have an enforceable duty to aid the distant needy. So unlike Singer, he thinks you don't do anything wrong if you're not helping. But, uh, and this is the soft-hearted part of it, uh, he does think aiding the distant needy would be a very nice thing. It ought to be encouraged. It ought to be praised. You know, we, we ought to uh, feel good about ourselves if we aid the distant needy. We ought to say nice things to other people if they do. But you don't do anything wrong by not doing it. And that's where the real disagreement with Singer comes in. Uh, and so just taking what Narvison and Singer are, are talking about and applying it to Elysium, in a very, you know, putting it in a nutshell, um, Singer would say, yes, the citizens of Elysium are doing something wrong by not helping the citizens of Earth and you know, hoarding their wealth for themselves and enjoying their very nice life where everybody else is suffering. Uh, they do something wrong by not helping. Narvison, on the other hand, would say, well, look, it'd be very nice for them to help. Uh, you know, they should be encouraged to help, praised for helping, right, thanked and so on. But they don't do anything wrong if they don't help, right? They don't do anything wrong if they just keep their resources for themselves. So, uh, and so one, and I'll, I'll just put this out there, one interesting way to approach 
uh, you know, the, the forums or, or the essay if you want to be writing on this topic is, uh, you know, thinking about how what Narvison and Singer say apply to what's going on in Elysium. And then also thinking about whether or not you're willing to extend the conclusion from Elysium to, you know, what's going on in that setting to our world or vice versa. So look, if you think Singer is right, the city and citizens of Elysium do something wrong by not helping the, the citizens of Earth, of Earth. Um, but you don't think uh, people who can help now, including me and quite possibly you, uh, if you don't think those people now are doing something wrong by not helping, what's the difference? Right? What's the difference between, say, me and uh, you know, somebody on a lease and not helping the citizens of Earth. So, good question. All right, so let's take a, a look here. All right, so like I've said, uh, Narvison is uh, an advocate of the um, social contract view. Uh, this, uh, this is a view that cuts through both ethics and political philosophy, it applies to both, and Nervous himself is, is written on, on both of these. Um, so we can talk about social contract ethics or contractarian ethics, that was the, the phrase I was using, uh, just two different ways of talking about basically the same thing. So the social contract view considers justice and or morality, because you can be a contract theorist in one domain but not the other, or both, or neither. Uh, Narvison is in, in both, but we can yeah, you know, we're, we're going to focus mainly on morality here, but he's also going to be distinguishing between justice and morality in this piece in a way that he thinks is, is very relevant for this discussion. So the social contract view considers uh, justice and or morality to be the con uh, product of an implicit contract. So it's not a contract we actually make, you know, we don't get together as a society and, and sort of bargain and set up terms, but instead through our actions, through what we do, through the, the give and take of social enterprise and dealing with other people, we produce a kind of implicit contract, a, an agreement or an understanding about um, what we owe each other, what we're going to do for each other, what we're not gonna do for each other, and so on. So our duties, uh, and they can be duties of morality or, or duties of justice, so they can be moral duties or political duties. Again, we'll come back to this a little bit more uh, quite shortly. Um, really, depend on what, as self-interested agents, is rational for us to consent to. So um, if you've studied, say, Thomas Hobbes um, or, or looked at egoism to any extent, um, they're very much in the background there. They're sort of the, the basis of these sorts of contract views. So they look at us as really you know, Hobbes as well as it, egoism as a, a psychological theory, look at us as primarily self-interested agents. We're always sort of in it for ourselves to some extent. We're motivated to act in ways that are good for us. Um, we are not primarily altruistic, which is not to say we never do anything for anybody else. And in fact, we're gonna see Narvison thinks that's probably a bad way to be, right? Just being a, a selfish jerk all the time. He's gonna get you very far. But when it comes right down to it, what are we ultimately interested in? ourselves and, and how we're doing, how well we're doing, right? Um, now, Narvison's not interested here in looking at what we might consider to be exceptional cases, so, you know, serial killers or, or sort of deranged, however we might want to categorize those. Uh, people we think are, in some sense, not of sound mind, right? He, but he thinks the vast majority of people really are self-interested in this way, even if we pretend like we're not. Now. Ultimately, it is in each of our best interests to get all the benefits from, from a contract or an exchange uh, without having to pay the costs. So look, let's say I want to sell you my car, right? You want to buy a used car, I want your money. Um, it's better for both of us to get the benefit without paying the cost. It's better for me to get your money and not give you the car. It's better for you to get my car and not give me the money. But of course, if that's, that's the way we go, um, you know, if you just steal my car, I just steal your money, you know, we're, we're going to be pretty sore about it. We're, we're not going to be happy about that state of affairs. Uh, all of a sudden, one of us is losing out, uh, and that's going to make us upset and angry, and we might lash out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So ultimately, we all want what's in our best interests, and this is really what 
provides the foundation for our, our duties and our whole concepts of what morality demands of us and what justice demands of us. Now, free riders are an issue. The, the people who try to get the benefits without paying the costs. Narvison doesn't think that's too much of a problem, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, and, and free riders, the easiest way to think about this is if you have a system of public transit, right, you know, buses and whatever, uh, that people, you have to pay a fare and then you get to ride it. You get the benefit by riding, paying the fare is the cost to you. Um, you are a free rider if you ride for free, that is you ride but don't pay the cost, right? You get on when the driver's distracted or whatever uh, and don't actually pay the fare. You get the benefit without paying the cost. Now it's in all of our best interest to do that, right? For everybody that rides public transit, it's in their best interest to uh, ride for free. But of course, if everybody does that, then the whole system's gonna collapse because if nobody's paying fares, then there's nothing for the thing to ride on. And of course, let's set aside questions of public funding and things like that. Okay, so we'll come back to free riders a little bit later here. So thinking in these terms, thinking in these social contract terms, something is a duty when there is good reason, interpersonally considered, to require the person in question to do or refrain from the act in question. Uh, interpersonally is really between persons, right? Uh, Narvison explains that rights can be understood in terms of duties. So for example, if everyone has a right to life and property, then everyone has corresponding duties not to kill or steal, right? For, uh, you know, for us to say that each of us has a right to life means that each of us has a duty not to kill each other. To say that we have a right to property means that we each have a duty not to take each other's stuff. Uh, and then, then Nervison thinks we can just make sense of, of rights in that way. So um, when we think about rights, you know, rights to, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, or whatever, right? Uh, whatever it might be. Narvison thinks the right way to think about that is in terms of what we should or shouldn't do to each other. Um, there are other ways of trying to think of rights, but then they start getting sort of abstract. You know, what, what is a right if it's not just uh, some kind of duty or obligation other people have to treat you or to not treat you in certain sorts of ways? Now, Narvison distinguishes between reparation, dire need, and helping. So three different, um, three different things. So reparations are really a kind of, of uh, compensation, right? We owe reparations to someone or some group when we're responsible for harming them, right? So if you, um, I don't know, come steal my car, you owe me some kind of, uh, reparation for that. If you come in and hurt me, physically hurt me, well, you owe me some kind of reparation for that. Helping is, is different. It's still giving something to somebody, right? So you owe me reparations for, for hurting me and you owe me a thousand dollars. Helping, um, and you owe me the thousand dollars because you hurt me. Helping is making someone better off by acting, but not worsening their situation by not acting. You don't just owe me a thousand dollars, right? If you didn't hurt me or, or anything, now you giving me a thousand dollars would make me better off, right? It'd be great, you know. And, and uh, this is a joke. Tips are most welcome, right? <laughs> Feel free to give me a little tip if you think the, the the videos are really great or you're enjoying the course. Seriously, though, I'm not going to take a bribe. That's this is not going to happen. Um, but right, someone just giving somebody something whether it's money or time, whatever it might be, when they don't owe it to them, it's not a reparation, that's what helping is. Now, dire need is a particular kind of situation people find themselves in. That's the, the thing that's most relevant here. Uh, dire need, the way Narison conceives of it, and this seems pretty neutral at this point, right? It's not like this seems very loaded. Uh, dire need is really where someone will be badly off, such as suffering or even dying, if we don't act. Singer's kind of situation. So the question really is, are we obligated to act to improve someone's situation when they are in dire need? So for example, Singer's drowning child example, right? Um, do we do something wrong by not helping the drowning child? Or do, do, we, do we do something wrong by not helping the distant needy who are in dire need, right? Is our help to them, is that a matter, you know, if, if okay, that would just to beg the question. 
if we do something to make their situation better, like we go in to try to save the drowning child and give resources to the distant needy, is that a form of helping, right? Uh, are we obligated to do it, right? We didn't make them be in the bad situation we're in, presumably, right? I'm assuming you didn't throw the child into the pond or something. Um, you know, it's highly likely me and, and you, whoever's watching this, have not directly gone out of your way to somehow make uh, the situation of, of people in dire need worse, right? It's not, presumably, like you went and took away their food or their, their health resources or something like that. So do we owe them something? Do we have a duty to aid? This is really the question. Now, there are two basic kinds of duties Singer wants to, or uh, Narvison wants to distinguish between. And we're going to, uh, next slide, also distinguish between duties of justice and duties of morality. So we're gonna get around to that distinction between morality and justice, but this is just a distinction between two basic different sorts of duties uh, that can apply within the domains of justice or morality. So positive and negative duties. Now, positive duties require an agent and an agent is really just anyone, right? Me, you, any, any person, any moral agent, require us to do something, right? It's, it's active. You, a positive duty requires you to actually, you know, sort of get up off the couch and, and do something about it. So for instance, uh, with Singer, right? Uh, Singer holds we have a duty to aid the distant needy or to save the drowning child. You do wrong by not actively helping. Just think about that second premise in Singer's argument that we were talking about last day, where there's the strong version and the weak version. It, uh, the, the weak version read, if it is in our power to prevent something very bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything else morally significant, we ought morally to do it. Right? That's a kind of positive duty. We have to go out of our way to do those good things. Now, negative duties, instead of requiring us to do something, require us to refrain from doing something. So for instance, most of us would agree that, uh, you know, going out of your way to hurt the distant need, right? If you're the cause of, uh, you know, someone being in dire need, you know, you burned their house down or stole their food or something, right? Or, or took their money, or, you know, you actively were drowning the child, you know, you threw them in the pond, or in fact, you waded in and sort of are holding them down and trying to drown them. You know, we have a negative duty to not do that kind of thing, all right? Um, now, a negative duty on its own doesn't require you to actually do something. Right? We have all sorts of, of negative duties. Um, and Narvison really holds the view that our basic human rights are negative in nature. And he calls this the classical view, sort of the classical um, liberal view of you know, the 19th century. Um, really, the basic human duties that correspond to the basic human rights are really to avoid inflicting evils on people. So we have duties not to make people's situations worse, right? We have a duty to not drown the child. We have a duty to not burn somebody's house down or steal their resources or, uh, you know, make them sick or whatever. But, and this is where Narvison wants to distinguish between justice and morality, Narvison does not think that we generally have uh, a, a firm set of positive duties uh, that require us to actually go out of our way and do certain things with other people. So let's take a look at, at that, that distinction between duties of justice and duties of morality. So duties of justice are essentially negative in nature, right? Don't kill other people, don't steal things, don't, don't do anything that, that harms another person or makes them worse off. These sorts of duties are enforceable and universally obligatory. Now, why is that? So duties of justice, these are the sorts of duties that are legally enforceable. Narvison thinks this is really part of our you know, political legal framework. It's worth our while to actually spend resources on enforcing these. What does that mean? Well, you know, uh, the justice system does not work for free, right? Police officers, lawyers, judges, um, prison guards, et cetera, et cetera. The, when we talk about those sorts of positions, those are, are jobs people have, right? Jobs, careers. Um, 
I don't know anybody who just volunteers full time to be a police officer or a lawyer or, or a judge. Right? That's, it's a thing we pay people for. Now, generally speaking, um, I, I have trouble thinking of a situation where this isn't uh, very true. Within political society, we have a, a public, publicly funded version of all of these things, right? So there, there are private security firms and so on, and people hire lawyers privately for, for various sorts of reasons and so on. But there is a, a publicly funded police service, right? which is paid via taxes. So, you know, depending on your own situation, you may, may have paid a considerable amount of taxes at this point in your life, maybe not too much. Uh, I know, you know, when I, I was younger and first thinking about a lot of these issues, hadn't paid a lot of taxes yet. That was pretty nice. Now I pay, well, I'll, I'll just sort of ballpark and say, I, I tend to pay something like a third of my salary in taxes over the course of the year, right? That's, that's a fair chunk of money. If I had all that money back, I could do all kinds of things. Really like a hot tub, don't have one of those yet, but you know, I suppose it's worthwhile to pay for police to make sure that my stuff doesn't disappear, et cetera. So how, how can we justify these sorts of duties? Well, think back to the egoism, the self-interest. It's in all of our interests, unless you know, we are people who want to <laughs> harm other people, you know, kill or steal or whatever. It's in our interests, you know, all of our interests, to have some sort of system set up to uh, maintain these, these duties, to enforce these duties and, and rights. So you know, I have a right to my property, which means you have a duty not to take it. Right? If you violate your duty by taking my stuff, you simultaneously violate my right. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means I should have some sort of, of recourse, right? I can call the police or whatnot, hopefully get some kind of reparation from it. And as Nervison points out, we're all vulnerable, right? We're all vulner vulnerable to theft, murder, et cetera. So it's in all of our interest to agree to some scheme of duties um, where we agree that we should all be protected from certain sorts of harms. Right? Uh, and having that kind of basic agreement is required for us to be able to do anything else in society. Right? If I don't have that basic kind of agreement, if I can't assume that uh, you know, I'm gonna be protected from violence, murder, right? Uh, you know, when I, if I leave my house and I come back, all my stuff's going to be gone and there's just nothing I do about it. There's no police, right? I don't have a right to it. I don't have any property rights or anything. Well, I'm probably never gonna leave my house, right? I'm always gonna you know, be sitting around here guarding my hoard of treasure or something. So these are the duties of justice. These are the, the really basic things uh, that are always in our interest to maintain. Duties of morality on the other hand, are usually positive. They might also be negative, but they're usually positive, but they're also weaker nervous and things. So they're not enforceable in the same way. Now it's worthwhile to encourage moral behavior, people doing what they should morally speaking, the, the duties of morality, but mutual agreement here is harder to attain. Uh, and the costs of enforcing uh, um, <clears throat> uh, compliance with moral duties is also harder and, and just generally not worth it. So this broader disagreement uh, over morality, right? So just thinking back to what I was talking about with, with duties of justice, there's pretty widespread agreement that basic things like we all have a right to, you know, life, property of some sort, um, different sorts of freedoms, freedoms of, you know, at least to some degree, speech and thought and association and, and et cetera, right? Um, there's, there's pretty broad agreement. There are not many people who are going to go around and say, oh yeah, we don't actually have a right to life. It's fine to just go kill people if you feel like it. Right? Now, there are the odd ones, right? The, the murderers or the serial killers or whatever. But that's exactly why Narberson wants to sort of set them aside. Right? That's, that's a slim minority of people. Uh, and when we're thinking in terms of uh, social contract terms about what will most of us, the majority of us, agree to. Right? Well, what kind of contract or agreement will we come to uh, and, and abide by in living with each other? Well, we can, in some sense, put that slim minority of people and, you know, the, right, the murderers and whatever, stick them in a little box and say, okay, we're just not going to take their disagreement into consideration here because it's not really going to threaten uh, 
the vast majority of us agreeing to this basic scheme of, of rights and, and duties. Now, when it comes to morality, how we should act in various ways, there's much broader disagreement here, right? Situations vary considerably between people and times, uh, and we, there, there's just more diversity in views, right? Is it okay to tell uh, a white lie to somebody to not hurt their feelings, right? You're gonna have broader disagreement over, on, on answering that question than you would um, with, you know, do people have a right to life, right? Right to life, probably 99 plus percent of people are gonna say, well, yeah, of course, right? Like, what are you, insane? Um, it comes to the white lie question, right? Oh, a lot more divergence, right? It's certainly not gonna be 99% one way or the other. Um, you're, you're gonna get much more nuanced responses, right? And it's gonna depend on, on time and place and who's involved and all sorts of various considerations. Now, because of this kind of, of disagreement, it's harder to come up with a set of duties about how we ought to behave in specific sorts of ways. And it's also just generally not worth the cost of strictly enforcing moral duties. So look, for instance, throwing someone in prison for being rude, that's costly, right? Think about the actual costs required to arrest somebody, you know, put them through trial or whatever, put them through the justice system, then to actually lock them up for some amount of time. That's not free, right? It's, it, there are real costs, monetary costs involved with doing that. Is it really worth it, right? I have a rude neighbor who really, frankly, it just bugs me a lot, right? And I've, I've, more or less told them just to screw off and then leave me alone and not talk to me anymore. Now, that's, that's worth it, right, in some sense, in my self-interest, right? I, I want him to leave me alone because he bothers me and I just don't like it. I think he likes bothering me. I don't know if he even realizes that he is. But it's certainly not worth me, you know, paying some security firm or something or, or paying the state to arrest him and, and lock him up, right? That's a much greater cost to me than just telling them to get lost and get out of here and stay off my property. So, uh, also the you know trying to figure out at, at what point do we lock people up for for being rude or something like that, right? But much more difficult to um, figure that out. Now, even though it's not worth the cost of trying to get uh, near universal compliance with the duties of morality, right? It's not worth arresting people and throwing them in jail and, and trying to come up with, uh, you know, enshrining them in the legal system, right? Is there a legal definition of rudeness? Probably not, right? Does the, uh, um, you know, legal system in Canada care if you tell a white lie to somebody to save their feelings? You know, probably not. Do they care if you lie somebody uh, in, in a contract, right? If I lie to you about the state of my car that you're trying to buy off me, Am I liable for that? You know, will the justice system get involved? Yeah, at that point now, you know, if I'm committing fraud or something, uh, now all of a sudden we're willing, just generally speaking, to shoulder that burden of having the legal system be involved, all right? Uh, and just like, look, you know, if, if somebody stole something from me and the thing was only worth $20, you know, are they gonna call in the, the Mounties and, you know, conduct a big search or something? No. Right, probably gonna say, okay, well that sucks. Uh, tell us about it. You know, you can file a report. We'll tell you if it shows up somewhere. Like, like they're not gonna go out and try to track down. Like, let's just say it's an old lawn chair or something. I have, right? Uh, you know, if it gets stolen, well, shucks. You know, maybe I should have been a bit more careful and locked it up better or or something. But right? it's just not worth the cost of, of actively trying to pursue getting that back. Now. Even though it's not worth the cost of trying to enforce moral duties in that same way we enforce, enforce uh, duties of justice, it is generally worth the fairly minimal cost of encouraging moral, that is, pro-social behavior through certain rewards. What are we talking about? Praise, admiration, favoritism, right? We associate with people uh, whose conduct we approve of, right? And especially when you are out in, in sort of a let's just call it the wide world, right? You get to pick who to associate with. Now, uh, depending on your own, you know, your own personal situation and, and your age and so on, uh, you know, I can remember being younger. So if you happen to be a, a younger person, what, you know, what am I thinking in terms of younger here? 20-ish maybe. Um, 
you know, growing up, the, the way education works, uh, or at least my experience of it, going through primary school and secondary school, it's like the social pressure cooker. You're sort of locked up in confined spaces with certain people you just happen to be of roughly the same age at and live in the same geographical vicinity of. Uh, and you're stuck together for years and years, and it's this whole social experiment, right? which I was not a big fan of. And then once you get out, right, even at you know, university, college, something like that, there you are in some sense forced to interact with certain people. When you're, you know, you have a certain kind of job, right? You'll be forced to interact with certain kinds of people, depending on what the job is and who your coworkers are and so on. But once you're out of that sort of social experiment of the public schooling, uh, you've got a lot of choice, right? Who your friends are, where you live, what kind of career you have, what kind of, of job you want to take, um, who you choose to spend your time with, right? how we treat other people, how we talk about them, right? Do we say that they're great people and, and thank them for doing things and, and do things like that to make them feel good? Well, it depends on what they do. So I've got this one neighbor who I don't like very much and I'm fairly rude to. Why? Because that neighbor annoys me, right? They never help me. They don't do anything that's beneficial to me. They just try to eat up my time and annoy me. So I'm rude and I try to drive them away, right? Maybe you don't want to be my neighbor. Okay. And guess what? There are people like me out there. And the wonderful thing about a, a you know, free country like ours, I can be a rude jerk all I want, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. But there is, right? They cannot be my friend. They cannot reciprocate. They cannot go out of their way to help me. Now, I have other neighbors who I love, and they are amazing. And I get along very well with them because they're nice, right? They're entertaining, they tell a good story, they're willing to assist me with things and I'm willing to assist them. So it's not like I'm just a horrendous tyrant of the neighborhood, right? And I drive everybody away and I'm a terrible person. But how I interact with people in my private life, right, is dictated by how they interact with me. I get to choose who I wanna spend time with, I get to choose how I socialize with them, I get to choose how to treat them. There are certain duties of justice, right? I can't go burn down the house of the neighbor I don't like. Well, I suppose I, I could, I'm not going to, right? Why? Because this is where police get involved and I might suffer some very bad consequences, right? It also just seems extreme. It doesn't seem unwarranted for the, the sort of behavior I've encountered. Um, but then when it comes to, to duties of morality, you know, do I have a moral duty to be nice to that neighbor who I find exhausting and so on? This is where the disagreement comes in. Some of you might say, oh, you're actually, you're doing something wrong by being mean to them. Great, right? Some of you say, yeah, right? Screw them, whatever, you know, do, do whatever you need to do. This is exactly where the disagreement comes in. And this is exactly where we aren't willing to shoulder the costs of trying to enforce some universal set of duties, like duties of justice. But we are willing to enforce those duties of morality in weaker ways right, in our behaviors, and what we say to other people, how we treat them, how we go out of our way to spend our resources, including our time and money and energy and so on, with other people. Which brings us to this next point. What does aiding the needy entail? Well, it requires spending our limited resources. Different kinds of aid require different amounts and kinds of resources, and we all have different limited resource budgets, as Narvison talks about them. So for instance, time is a limited resource for all of us, right? There's only so much time we have, and we just can't help everybody, right? We can't do everything for everybody. We probably can't even do all the things we wanna do for ourselves, right? And I know I find in, in my life, time is often one of my, my scarcest resources. Right? Having time to do all the various things I want, time to do all my work, time to talk to all the people I want, time to read all the things I want to do, right? to engage in all the activities I want. So if somebody wants something that's going to take up my time, say one of my neighbors who's very helpful and I like very much, 
comes and asks me for a favor and it's going to take a few minutes. Great, sure. What if it's going to take a few hours? I probably hesitate a bit more. But it's going to take a few days or weeks or months. Probably not. Almost certainly not. Uh, our money, our expertise, really anything we have to offer somebody is part of our resource budget. Right? We all have different costs as well. Right? Some people get good feelings from helping others or from socializing, but other people don't get those feelings. In fact, some even feel drained by those actions. They have to, in some sense, fight against their own nature to go out of their way to help somebody or even to socialize. Right? Some people just don't enjoy it. The respective costs that people have for the same sorts of actions are different. And Narvison holds that we determine our own costs and benefits by what he calls an intuitive assessment. Right? Um, how much does it cost me to go to a party and socialize for a few hours versus how much does it cost you, if anything? Right? It might just be a benefit to you, but maybe it's a cost to me or vice versa. Right? Maybe spending my time, spending an hour or two helping somebody with a, some kind of project, I see as a cost. And in fact, uh, depending on the different um, um, demands on my time, it might be a very large cost. Whereas for you, you just see it as a kind of benefit or a very small cost. Norris and Holtz, there's no universal, abstract, objective way of measuring these sorts of costs for all of us. Right? And so it's really up to us to do our own subjective assessment and determine what we're willing to spend on what kind of thing. Now, it is in our general interest to help those in need when the costs are low. This sets up a kind of mutual aid insurance, right? If I'm willing to help you, then you're likely more willing to help me. Just think about what I was saying with my, my neighbors here. Uh, and of course, there's nothing I can do to convince you one way or the other about whether or not I'm telling the truth about this or just you know, making up stories for, for pedagogical reasons. Uh, but it's, it's true, right? I have a neighbor who really annoys me. Well, at least one, right? I have at least one neighbor that I really like. The neighbor that I really like, I go out of my way to help. And I'd be happy to go out of my way to help in, in numerous sorts of ways, though there will be limits on that. The other neighbor or set of neighbors that I don't like very much, right? To even get a few minutes of my time out of me, it's really gonna depend on, on what it is they're looking for and, and just how crucial this is to their, um, you know, well-being, right? They want me to come and do some gardening for them. And no, right? You don't need that. If they need me to open a, a bottle of medication because they're having trouble doing it. If they don't get the medication that's inside of it, they're going to have a heart attack or you know, something terrible. Well, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not going to right, see them suffer like that just from not doing something. Now, thinking abstractly, Narvison thinks if we embrace a system of trying to help others, right, and generally helping people in an efficient manner so as to help the most people with the fewest resources, then our odds of being helped by such a system are generally good. We all need help sometimes, and we are more likely to receive that help by living within such a moral system. Now, of course, special relations and costs matter. Narvison maintains we won't help 100 strangers instead of our loved ones, and there's a serious difference between spending one day or one month assisting someone. As Narvison puts it, I think, very nicely, if I have to sacrifice most of a day to save the life of my neighbor, who, whom I've known for three decades, I will. If I have to sacrifice three months of my life, however, I won't, though there are some people who would. This is where we come back to, to free riders. So Narvison thinks it's in our own self-interest to set up this kind of mutual aid insurance, to be willing to help people, right, just as a, a matter of morality, when the costs are fairly low and we can help them fairly efficiently. Right? Uh, because if, we're will, if we live in that kind of, of society, right, uh, or especially we live in that kind of network that we choose to interact with people who set up this kind of mutual aid insurance and, and help each other in these sorts of ways, then we're more likely to get assistance when we need it than if we don't do that, right? Think about somebody who's just a selfish jerk all the time, doesn't ever help anybody else. When they need help, probably nobody's going to be there to help them. Right? And this, of course, you know, you think about little things we, we hear people say about morality, you know, little, little phrases and just little throwaway remarks, right? Often that self-interest that lies at the heart of morality comes up. Right? Well, look, if you don't help other people, who's going to be there to help you? Ah, so morality is really 
about helping yourself in the end. That's, that seems to be the, the lesson. And that's exactly what Narvison thinks. So this is where free riders come up again. People who are willing to um, reap the benefits, right, but not pay the costs. So they'll ride the bus, but not pay the fare. They'll take help from others, but they won't give it. Narvison thinks free riders will pose fairly little problem for this kind of mutual aid insurance. If people don't participate in our beneficial social schemes, then we're just unlikely to help them. Now, of course, we might end up helping an undeserving, un undeserving stranger, but such is life. But in the long run, people like that are likely to lose out. An unhelpful neighbor, work colleague, or friend is not likely to continue receiving assistance from others. We don't enforce obligations on such people, but we do have our own uncharitable views about them, and our views guide our interactions with other people. So if you know someone who you, right, you, you're starting to get to know them, they ask for your help, so you give them a bit of help, and then when the time comes and you ask them for a little bit of help, they won't give them, right? It only takes a few interactions like that for most people, though not all, to stop offering aid when it's needed by those sorts of people, right? People who are always taking and not giving, well, look, you know, maybe you're just the sort of person who, who enjoys giving, enjoys helping others, right? There are people like that. There are other people, frankly, like me, who don't, right? I'm happy to help somebody if they need it, right? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But if you're just constantly coming to me, right, wanting things, well, where's the benefit in it for me other than me spending my time and my energy and maybe my money trying to make you better off? What, is it just supposed to be the good feelings I'm supposed to get from it? Now, let me just take a moment here to remark, don't take anything I just said as some kind of comment telling you to leave me alone and don't come and ask for help. In terms of, of coursework or anything related to the university, very happy to help with that. I'm, I do want to draw a distinction here between my private life, which is largely what I'm talking about, and, and you know, my career, my public position, right, as your instructor, as a member of the university community, right? There are differences there. If you come and ask me for help with your assignment, you know, if you're one of my students, that's part of my obligation to you, which I, I willfully take on and frankly enjoy, right? But if just some random stranger comes down the street and say, hey, could you help me with my calculus homework? No, <laughs> why would I? That's first, I don't even really know enough to help anybody. Uh, and second, that just seems right, it's it's just a cost to me at that point. Right? Why why would I help you? Right? So don't take anything I've said here as, as some kind of subtle or not so subtle way of telling you to leave me alone and don't come and ask for help. By all means, feel free to get in touch with me if you've got questions, you want some assistance, you want some clarification. I am really happy. Okay, so this last point here, distance matters, right? And this is where there is some uh, pretty serious disagreement between Singer and Narvison. Now, of course, we've already been seeing that disagreement, right? What Narvison's already been telling us here, especially right on this slide about, you know, why, why do we help others? Why do we have any sort of duty to help others or, or motivation? Quite different from Singer. This point here, Singer thinks that uh, distance doesn't matter morally speaking, although it might matter in terms of whether or not we actually do help somebody. Now, Narvison notes that the farther away somebody is, the more resources it takes to assist that person, which makes our aid to them less efficient and it makes it less likely that they can reciprocate. Now, of course, telecommunications have made communicating easier. Right? We can communicate virtually across the globe fairly easily, but it still costs more money to ship a container of food around the world than it does to ship it down the street. We're also less likely to benefit from our assistance to the distant needy. If I help my neighbor, the odds of reciprocation are fairly high, though not guaranteed. The odds of the distant needing being willing and able to reciprocate aid to me is fairly low. So this brings us around to Narvison's ultimate point, right? Do we have an enforceable duty to aid the distant needy? Is there a duty of justice here, or even a moral duty that's actually enforceable in the sense that if we fail to live up to it, that we ought to suffer any sort of, of um, penalty or anything like that? Arvidsson's answer, no. Right? 
right? There's no enforceable duty to aid the distant needy. Right? There's no duty of justice here. You don't do anything wrong by not assisting. Why? Well, look, we're not responsible for their misery, right? It's not an irrational self-interest to agree to a scheme of duties, enforceable duties that would transfer our resources to those people. Right? So there's no enforceable uh, duty to do it. Right? The, the self-interest that really underlies the whole scheme of duties, moral and, and duties of justice that we have, uh, just does not speak in favor of this. And this is exactly why we live in a society, and frankly, you know, virtually all societies on earth have this kind of attitude. And okay, now maybe, maybe not quite all, that might be a little too, too hasty. Uh, but you know, think about what countries or, or communities actually force people to um, give large amounts of aid to the distant needy. Nobody really does what Singer wants, right? Even if we listen to the argument, we look at it, you know, we go, ah, oh, that's a good argument. But we don't do it, right? Which Narvison thinks shows that, in fact, there is something wrong with that whole approach to morality in the first place. But that takes it a little farther afield. Now, even though we're not uh, obligated, we don't have an enforceable duty to aid the distant needy, Narvison thinks it is likely in our collective self-interest to have good relations with other peoples, right? Other countries, other communities, right? Other groups. Uh, and we should all be disposed to approve of action to aid persons, however distant, even though such action is not required of us. Now, we don't know what the future holds, right? Good global relations are better than bad global relations. Affluent peoples can assist impoverished peoples for fairly little cost, right? Which suggests that we should. Right? It's in our self-interest to help the distant needy, at least to some extent. But an enforceable duty to aid others means that we can be justifiably coerced to aid others, and that means taxes. Narvison, being a libertarian politically, uh, equates taxes with theft. People, people's money is really theirs. They get to do with it as they see fit. Uh, and so we should have as few taxes, as few uh, coercive measures making people spend the resources in certain ways as possible. So the state really has no business taking money from people and giving it to whomever the state decides is deserving of it. And as Narvison puts it, charity balls are more fun than paying taxes. So the right way to go about aiding the distant needy is to encourage aid, to encourage charity, to encourage and reward people, to praise them for giving to others. There is some self-interest there, right? Well. The, the calculations of self-interest tell us that, you know, it's not, it's, it's not definitely in our interest to aid the distant needy. It almost certainly is not in our interest to give away most of our resources to the distant needy. But it is probably in our interest to help the distant needy, at least to some degree, voluntarily. Again, we all have to think about our own resource budgets, how much time or money or whatever do we really have to offer? What is it going to cost us to do that? But um, so, so, you know, it should be left up to individual discretion. So aiding the distant needy is not a matter of justice, but it is a matter of morals. It's worth encouraging people to do it, approving of such behavior, right? Saying nice things, giving rewards, uh, trying to make people feel good for doing it. But it's not in our collective interest to enforce such a duty. Therefore, we do nothing wrong by uh, failing to aid the distant needy. So it's, it's a good thing. Right? It's beneficial. Um, and we should be willing to talk like that. Right? It's good. You do a good thing by doing it. That's the moral thing to do. You're, you're a good person. But it's not absolutely required. It's thinking back to the, the terms that Singer was giving us, Narvison would say that aiding the distant needy, um, there, there's a couple of ways to think of it. For Narvison, it is part of morality, but not justice to aid the distant needy. So by not doing, you might do something wrong in terms of not living up to the kind of moral code that we might think is, is really best, but of course we don't really enforce those moral codes in strict sorts of ways, right? You might choose not to associate with people or even you know, say nice things about people who don't aid the distant need. But that's still in sort of a, I'll sort of coin a term, uh, the social free market, right? 
that's still amongst choices people make. Sure, people organize societies and, and you know, congregate with other like-minded people often, right? Not always, we interact with people we don't always agree with. Uh, but it's certainly not part of our enforceable duties of justice, right? Uh, we, we, we're not gonna get into the business of forcing people to aid the distant need, right? To give away 30% of their wealth or whatever it might be. Um, Narvis and things. So thinking in Singer's terms, one way of putting it, though I hesitate to do this a little bit, is that Narvison would still regard aiding the distant needy as something that's super erogatory. It's good to do, but you're not required to do it. You're not obligated to do it, right? You're really sort of going above and beyond by doing it. Now, of course, Narvison thinks it's, it's nice to do. It's a good thing, right? Um, you know, should you aid the distant needy? Well, sure, you know, to whatever extent, to whatever cost you're willing to bear. Right? And, and we'll call you a good person and say you're doing a good thing. But if you don't, right, it's not like you're failing, right? Uh, uh, failing to be a, a decent person, failing to live up to your basic duties and so on. Now, so even here, right, just, just even in the way I'm talking about the way Narvison framed it, you could try to drive a wedge in here to Narvison's case uh, and really try to pick apart these duties of morality and duties of justice uh, it, it, with what Narvison has said, um, even if it's not a duty of justice to aid the distant needy, there's, there still might be a case to be made there that it is a duty of morality. And so sure, we're not going to go out of our way to punish you for not aiding the distant needy, you know, failing to live up, you know, uh, carry your duty of morality. Uh, but that just speaks to what we will and won't do in terms of shouldering costs to punish each other for doing things that we don't think we should do, right? I'm not gonna to pay to lock somebody up for being rude to me or for telling me a white lie because they think it's gonna make me feel good, right? Even if I find out and then that makes me feel bad or whatever, right? That's just not worth the cost. So maybe that's all Narvison's really saying. Something interesting to think about. Good place to dig into the material, good place to think about the case. And then of course, there are also these broader uh, concerns, you know, is that contract view, the correct sort of view? Should we approach matters of morality from the questions of self-interest and what we would at least tacitly agree to? There again, stipulating some assumptions, right? Making cases for certain points, but if there's other points you need, uh, just saying, look, I'm just going to assume that this is the, the right way to approach it, right? Or not the right way, right? You could assume egoism is the right kind of view. We're all basically self-interested. So any workable moral theory has to be based on that to some degree. Could be. Right? And then you're going to have to admit that your argument is based on that assumption, which, if called into question, could call into the, uh, the conclusion of your argument in question. All right. I think that's probably enough of me sort of pointing out different little bits and pieces you can engage with here. So go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this week's content. I also hope quite a lot that you have an excellent long weekend. I'll see you next week when we're back talking about the question of whether or not humans should be genetically enhanced once we have the technology to do so. And we are basically there. So we'll be back next week to take a look at that. Until then, stay well and have fun.